uh, Adolf Hitler and Ahmadinejad says, make no mistake, if the world does nothing to stop him, <clears throat> excuse me, and Ahmadinejad really acquires nuclear warheads and can attach them to the high-speed ballistic missiles they already have, Ahmadinejad will be able to do in about six minutes what Adolf Hitler took six years to do. And that is to kill six million Jews, which, by the way, that's just about how many Jews there are in Israel today. And they have all been targeted by the radical Shia Islamic regime in Iran. Enter Purim. And that, that I believe, is why Purim can have an application to us today. I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to ask a question. Why does Satan want to annihilate the Jewish people? I mean, what would he accomplish were he to actually succeed? Again, here's the why behind the what. We know that Israel has been the target of demon-possessed men to, who have been satanically inspired to wipe them off the map. But why? We know that that's happened and is happening, but why is that happening? Now, I need for you to really think through this with me. I had a teacher in school that used to always, I used to hate it too. Uh, I liked the teacher. I just didn't like it when she said, now put on your thinking caps. <laughs> so put on your thinking caps and think through this with me, okay? Here's the why. Hypothetically, had Satan succeeded in the Old Covenant, theoretically he could have thwarted Jesus Christ's first coming. Now stay with me. Were he to succeed now under the New Covenant, theoretically he could attempt to thwart Jesus Christ's second coming. In other words, at his first coming, Jesus came through and as a Jew. And at his second coming, Jesus will come for and to the Jew. If there is no Jew for Jesus to come through, I know this all rhymes, or for or to, then in effect, you could nullify both the first and second coming of Christ. The scriptures tell us that at the end of the seven-year tribulation, the whole house of Israel will get saved. They will call for their true Messiah after having embraced the false Messiah. See, this again goes into our typology as it relates to the rapture. Think about this with me. You have three Hebrew slaves. Their names change to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're thrown into a fiery furnace that is turned up seven times hotter. Now, what happens in the middle of that furnace? They meet the Lord, their Savior, their Messiah, in the seven times hotter fiery furnace. I love it because King Nebuchadnezzar says, didn't we throw three men in there? Yeah, the fourth looks like unto the son of you know, man. In other words, it's a pre-Bethlehem appearance of Jesus Christ in the midst of the seven times hotter fiery furnace. And I love it because the text says that he says, come out. Listen, you, you threw him in there. You want him to come out now? I think if it were me, I would say, you know, I'm fine where I'm at. The Lord's here. Everything's cool, pun intended. <laughs> you want to kill me and the Lord's in here with me and he's saving me and I ain't coming out. <laughs> but here's the question, where's Daniel? Where's Daniel? Conspicuously gone. Absent. Daniel is a picture of the church. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, a picture of Israel the Hebrews, the Jews, who will find their true Messiah. Where? When? 
in the midst of the tribulation, at the midpoint, at the halfway point, after the false Messiah, the Antichrist, in place of Christ, the one whom they embrace as their Messiah, turns out to be the false Christ, as evidenced when, they, when he commits the abomination that causes desolation. Sacrificing, many believe, a pig and sprinkling the blood of that pig on the altar there in the newly rebuilt temple when he demands to be worshipped. And Israel will realize this is not our Messiah. <laughs> our Messiah would never do this and they will flee to the place prepared for them which I happen to believe is in modern day Jordan, a place called Petra where it's believed that Job lived. It is the coolest place in my homeland, my wife and I had the privilege of going there in 1997, and my cousin uh, took us to Petra. And I mean, time does not, you know, permit, but this is where it's believed that the Jews will flee to and be prepared, be uh, protected from the Antichrist for the last three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation, because it's at that point where they find Christ, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, you know these couple of, uh, you know, uh, illustrations where you have these Old Testament pictures. It's been said that the Old Testament will conceal what the New Testament reveals. See, you have this, this beautiful prophetic picture that is painted on the canvas of God's Word that points us to the one who would fulfill all of that which we have in the Old Testament. This is why we study the Old Testament. This is why we teach the Bible, the whole counsel of God from Genesis all the way to Revelation. You know, I was sharing Thursday night that when I first came to Jesus Christ in 1982, I didn't know any better. I was sort of a blank slate. I didn't know that you're supposed to start in the Gospel of John. I started in Genesis. And I started reading all the way through the Bible. It took me about six months, but I read for the first time uh, all through the Bible in about six months when I started in the Old Testament. And I gotta, I gotta confess, when I got into Leviticus, like where we're at on Thursday night, I started reading about the feasts and all the sacrificing of these animals and the shedding of the blood and all this stuff. I'm like, what? You mean they do that in church? I don't wanna, you mean I have to bring a lamb to church and kill it <laughs> and sprinkle its blood for my sins in my stead? And what's the feast of this and the feast of that? And, Passover and unleavened bread and how does this apply to me? This makes no sense to me. I mean, this was for them then. Surely it's not for me now. Oh, but wait a minute. You got seven feasts of which the Feast of Purim is not in, included. But you have seven feasts. And the first four were fulfilled with Christ's first coming. And the last three will be fulfilled in the rapture and the second coming of Christ. The next feast that has yet to be fulfilled is the Feast of Trumpets. Trumpets? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, again, I'm not the sharpest knife in the kitchen drawer, but trumpet, let's see, trumpet call of God, dead in Christ, rise first, put off corruptible, put on incorruptible, change in the twinkling of an eye, and then we'll be with the Lord forever, and therefore encourage each other. It sounds like the rapture to me. <laughs> but then after that, you have the Feast of uh, the Day of Atonement. What's the Day of Atonement? That's when Israel would atone for their sins. That's the second coming. Then you have the Feast of Tabernacles. What's that? That's the kingdom age and the new heavens and the new earth. And by the way, uh, what are you doing Thursday night? You got plans? Cancel them. You need to be here because we're going to study the feasts. All seven of them. We got to the first three, which the Passover, unleavened bread, and uh, uh, first fruits were prophetic pictures of the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fourth feast, the Feast of Pentecost, or Harvest, is a picture of the birth of the church age. And then we're going to get into the study of the Feast of Trumpets, and then a Day of Atonement, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. And I can't wait. It is one of my favorite studies in all of the Bible. Why? Because it tells me that Jesus is coming for me soon and very soon. <laughs> okay, back to our study. Uh, this from uh, Abrahamic uh, uh, Faith, it's a newsletter that I get 
He had an interesting uh, quote here. He said, if the Jews had not survived, neither would have the Messiah come. 